Okay, now it's time to talk about the diversity of mammals and all of the cool things that are diversifying within them. So here's a representation of the mammalian evolutionary tree. And you can see the first major division in there is between the monotremes, which are called prototherians, and the marsupials and eutherians, which you can jointly call the therians. Now, prototherians, or monotremes, have an interesting transitional property between mammals and reptiles, which is that they actually lay eggs. And then they incubate the egg outside of the body until it hatches. Then when you get into mar marsupials, they show sort of an additional transitional phase to um, uh, eutherian mammals, and that is the marsupials give early birth. As they keep the egg inside them, they give birth, but it's very early. And then the embryo develops with inside a pouch that the mother has. Whereas then if you keep going down the evolutionary branch that includes us, that is the eutherians, uh, there the embryo is retained in the female reproductive tract and they give birth to a much more developed embryo. Okay, we're going to start with prototherians. So they're oviparous, that means they actually lay eggs and then those eggs are incubated by the parents. Now there's a lot of other really cool things about them, um, such as the fact that they do have mammary glands, but they don't have nipples. So instead the young just kind of suck the milk from the fur as it seeps out of glands, mammary glands, uh, out onto the outside of the female. Now these include primarily the platypus and the echidna, which are found in Australia and New Zealand. You have a duck-billed platypus on the left there, and you have an echidna on the upper right with the very long tongue that an echidna uses, which is convergent on the long tongues of anteaters, which is primarily for eating insects, including ants. Okay, so a little bit more about the platypus. These are found primarily in Eastern Australia. I've been there and I really wanted to see one, but I never had the opportunity, which is still haunting me to this day. Uh, they use this bill or beak, if you will. It's not like a duck's beak, it just looks a bit like one, for uh, digging for crustaceans and worms and for feeling around in the mud. Uh, and there's some electrosensory capabilities of that bill, which helps them to find buried things. Uh, also, they build nests in riverbanks. So you, they go underneath the riverbank and then far up into the riverbank, where they lay two to four eggs, which then hatch in about eight days, and then they nurse the young for five months. So there's a platypus mother um, nursing her young inside the burrow. So another cool thing about the platypus is that they have like a little... Uh, spur on their back leg, their back leg, that is actually venomous. So they're one of the few venomous mammals. Quarantine well. A new report has found that platypus fur glows green under UV light, which is going to make for a super messed up scene on CSI Brisbane. Now, I know what you're saying. You're saying, Stephen, why are these people shining UV lights on platypuses? Well, as one of the researchers explained, it was a mix of serendipity and curiosity. Buddy, that's a lot of $10 words just to say me and Dale got high in the lab. <laughs> now the echidna is the other main monotreme. These are the short and long-nosed spiny anteaters. They're not related to the actual anteaters. That's just sort of a nickname. They're insectivores with this long sticky tongue and a temporary pouch that they hold the egg in after they lay it, which hatches like the platypus in about eight days and then develops in the pouch where these spines start to form. Remember, I said that the echidna is another thing that has the evolution of spines, like porcupines or hedgehogs. Okay, so we're out of the monotremes now, and we're into the therians, and we'll start with the marsupials. So they don't lay eggs like the monotremes did. That is, they're viviparous, not oviparous. They give birth to live young. Uh, they have a very short gestation period inside the female, but then a long nursing period of the embryo outside the um, oviduct of the female. Uh, and the placenta of the female, but in a pouch instead. So the newborn has to get uh, from the reproductive tract of the female out and then up into the pouch, and it's a pretty harrowing experience. And then they attach to a nipple inside the pouch where they complete development. I imagine a pretty harrowing and risky experience for the embryo to get into the pouch. But then once it's in the pouch, it has a really great place to hang out. So it can come out and explore a bit and then jump back in the pouch. There's a lot of funny videos of that. There's other cool marsupials, such as the, the quotes, Tasmanian devil, uh, which is the largest marsupial carnivore right about now. It's the size of a small dog. These are scavengers, but they're extinct on mainland Australia due to hunting um, and to dingoes. Now, they weren't the largest marsupial carnivore of the past, because that was the thylacine, the Tasmanian tiger. 
which again shows the convergent evolution of a dog-like form. But it's not related to um, canids at all. It's not related to dogs at all. It's a completely separate origin of this dog-like lifestyle. Now, you might think that uh, this went extinct a long time ago, but it actually only went extinct in 1936 or thereabouts. And so, we actually have lots and lots of pictures of the thylacine. And if you want to learn more about the thylacine, you can follow that hashtag on Twitter. Now, the truth is, it's quite poignant in some respects because they went extinct so recently that we actually have footage of live thylacines. And this is one of the last known thylacines. This video was taken in 1936 in a zoo in Australia, and it died soon after this. And uh, now there's a lot of discussion of trying to bring it back um, by resurrecting it. Super sad that uh, it went extinct. Look at how much it acts like a dog, when again it's not at all related to a dog. Anyway, it's very sad. So you can learn more about platypuses and thylacines in many ways, but here are a couple of excellent books that I quite enjoyed reading about them. Platypus were really interesting in evolutionary history. Um, in the history of evolutionary biology, because they form another one of these apparent missing links. So remember I discussed uh, how Archaeopteryx appeared to be a missing link between reptiles and birds, thereby bolstering Darwin's theory of evolution. Platypus was long debated as to what its actual evolutionary position was and how it informed Darwin's theory of evolution. Now we're going to grade into the Therians, or what are sometimes called the placental mammals, uh, but first, let's just point out that marsupials diverged from those early placentals 100 million years ago. So there's a, it's a 100 million year split between the thylacines lineage and the lineage that would go on to become dogs. 100 million years, and yet look how similar they looked. Now, um, marsupials were found in South America, North America, and Australia, and New Guinea. Uh, now, most of the North American marsupials are extinct, except, of course, the possum. And there's a possum on the left that's uh, uh, faking that it's dead, which is one of its defense mechanisms if it's caught uh, out exposed. Okay, so we're on to the eutherians. Um, these include 94% of all the mammal species. They're viviparous, like us, so they give birth to live young with no pouch or shell egg. Of course, we have the amniotic egg, but it's retained within the female reproductive tract, and now the embryo is nourished via a placenta. As I said, placentas are also found in marsupials, but they're more developed within eutherians. We better take a little bit of time to talk about the placenta because it's a key feature of eutherians, including us. Now, as you know, most mammals, um, and you have an opossum on the upper left there, uh, have a long gestation period where the, the embryo is nourished and develops inside the mother by, via the placenta. Now, that occurs in a marsupial for a very short period of time, but in, in eutherians like us, or elephants would be the extreme, the embryo is nourished for a very long time, and when uh, it's, it's born, it's much more developed than that of, say, a marsupial. Now, the placenta itself is an organ that's formed jointly by the embryo and the mother after implantation. Now, it's a combination of extra embryonic membranes uh, and a uterus lining of the mother and it's the site of gas, nutrient, and waste exchange between the mother and the embryo. So, of course, an embryo, a developing embryo inside the mother is not breathing, and it's not getting any of its own nutrition, so it has to get that from the mother, which, of course, comes via the umbilical cord, which is connect connected to the placenta. So what's happening in the placenta is that you're having the uh, diffusion of small molecules, including oxygen and carbon dioxide, uh, between the mother and the uh, embryo and the fetus. Now, one of the really important things there, of course, is to get oxygen from the mother into the fetus. Now, the way this is achieved with uh, the fetus inside the developing mother and the mother's circulatory system is via higher uh, oxygen affinity in the fetal hemoglobin than in the adult hemoglobin. So basically, it's easier for fetal, he fetal hemoglobin to grab onto the oxygen that the mother is releasing. Also moving across the placenta include urea, 
You remember, you need to get rid of urea, but now the fetus itself can't pee, so it has to put that urea into the mother, which then does the peeing for the baby. Uh, also nutrients, the embryo has to develop, and it doesn't have like a big yolk sac, like in the egg of a frog or a reptile. Rather, it has to get that from the mother, so it includes sugars, vitamins, minerals. You also get hormones uh, from the mother's reproductive system, but unfortunately, things like alcohol and drugs like caffeine and cocaine can also diffuse across that boundary. I want to return back to this idea of these highly diversified circulation systems in many organisms, and we've been comparing them throughout. And we talk about the particular uh, two-circuit system with the four-chambered heart of uh, mammals and birds. But I also mentioned earlier that the circulation system of a fetus within the mother is quite different because now uh, the blood is actually exchanging the things it needs and getting rid of its waste products into the mother's reproductive system through the placenta. So that means that you have a different flow pattern of blood through the heart and through the body, including, for example, skipping the liver because now the mother performs those tasks for the embryo. So you have a massive reorganization uh, right around birth of the circulatory system of the embryos. If you remember, I talked about this shunt between the different circuits in the crocodiles and the rest of the reptiles occurring in different places. So in the fetus of mammals, including us, we have a couple of different shunts and they're described in the upper right there. And both of those shunts serve the purpose of making sure the blood goes where it's needed and not where it isn't needed. So it keeps the blood away from the lungs, for example. Now, those shunts sometimes don't close properly, which causes uh, heart problems in some uh, developing humans. Okay, so in closing the mammals, I just want to return to the eutherians. And you know a bit about them. Those are just some pictures that I've taken over the years of a bunch of different eutherians. And I want to ask you the question of which do you think is the most speciose group, that is the most species, the most diverse group within the mammals? So A is the primates, B is the bats, uh, C are the rodents, the D are the undulates, and E is the cetaceans. So what do you think is the most diverse mammal group? Where has evolution been its most extravagant? Well... Again, I was joking earlier, it's always C, and C again, it's the rodents. The average mammal is a rodent. <laughs> rodents are an exceptionally diverse group. Bats are also highly diverse. So the evolution of flight uh, is one of the things that allowed the occupation of a whole suite of new opportunities for life and caused great diversification into a bunch of different forms of life. But rodents win the prize for diversity. And my favorite rodent, of course, is the largest rodent, which is the capybara. So these are capybaras or capybaras from Panama. And I just want to point out this, this really uh, funny book about, by a Walt Disney uh, illustrator by the name of Bill Peet. He wrote a whole series of separate books, which I highly recommend for your 10-year-old um, nieces and nephews. And he had a pet capybara when he was a kid. And so he wrote a book about their pet capybara called Capyboppy. And this huge capybara is not the biggest rodent. There were bigger rodents in the past. So this one was described recently based on uh, fragmentary fossils. And uh, a colleague, another colleague of ours in the Red Path Museum, Virginie Millienne, uh, who studied a lot about teeth and morphology and development, including in the fossil record, was very skeptical of the size estimate that they had made uh, for this rodent. And so she plotted here the size of the skull uh, for things where you know the size of the skull in relation to uh, the size of the upper tooth row, which is what they'd found. They'd found a single tooth and tried to extrapolate it to that size up there, but she showed that that extrapolation is too far. And so, yes, it was big, but not that big. Okay, that's it.